Good morning and welcome to James North Baptist Church. We're delighted that you've joined us as God's people this morning to gather and to worship him. I'm going to highlight just a few announcements. Pastor Paul's going to come up and highlight one as well. But if you're new to the church, we'd encourage you to fill out the kit cards. Kit cards are keeping in touch, and they let us know that you're here. It lets us get in touch with you. So if you're newer to the church, we encourage you to fill that out so that we know we're here. We can be in touch with you if there's something that uh, you'd like, some information you'd like, we can get that to you. Um, this Tuesday and next Tuesday, there are membership classes. In order to be part of the membership classes, you need to have been part of this Discovering James North, either, uh, either right now or previously. Um, Discovering James North will happen two or three times a year. Uh, Jordan and Deanna Spolster have been leading that. And in order to join the, James, uh, the, the membership classes, you need to have been part of Discovering James North, which just wrapped up uh, last week. And then we'll send you a package, and that's this Tuesday and next Tuesday, 6.30 to 8 here at the church. Um, many of you know that we received a $500,000 donation recently, and in that donation, uh, if we're able to match that five hundred with another $500,000, it takes our mortgage down to $1.5 million. And at that point, that donor is prepared uh, to give us an interest-free mortgage with him, and he'd pay off our mortgage. And uh, so we are having a walkathon um, to try to match it. About $60,000 come in so far. We're very thankful for that. We have donors that are talking to me about how they can participate. But on December 4th, we would like to host a walkathon from 930 uh, till 12. And truthfully, you can walk, run, or ride. Uh, Miriam, uh, I wanted to say Beatty. Miedema. No, I know. Miriam, thank you, Rob. Uh, Miriam, Miedema, and Rob are really giving some leadership to that. You can talk to them after if you'd like, but we need you to sign up in the next couple days. So this is the way that you and your family can participate. We'll have information that you can give to parents or grandparents, and there'll be tours here at the church after, um, so we'll be touring people here. So I know some of you are already donating, some of you are already giving, but if this is the way that you want your kids to be able to participate, if this is the way that you want family to be able to participate, sign up by Wednesday uh, so that we know that you're willing to participate because it's only less than two weeks away and then at that point in time, uh, we will be hosting that if enough of us have signed up. So that's the walkathon to raise money for James North. More details will come uh, to get us down to a 1.5 million interest free mortgage. Uh, last announcement I have is the Christmas dinner. So we are not having our traditional Christmas dinner um, as we can't just fill the place. But we are having one for those that are part of uh, the Hub, North End Landing, Coffee's On. And so if you're interested in helping on December the 11th, that's a Saturday, either in setting up and getting it prepared or after uh, in cleaning up or helping with the meal, uh, we'd encourage you to email the church office so that we can know that you want to help. And now I'll ask Pastor Paul to come up and offer some announcements about Christmas hampers. So every year for 27 years, we've handed out Christmas hampers uh, during the, well, we're doing it December 18th this year. We're preparing this year to probably do about 250 to 300 hampers for those in our neighborhood that need a little assistance with food, uh, groceries, a Christmas dinner really. We put a turkey and potatoes and apples and kind of a full box. If you've ever taken part with us, you know it's a great box and it's a great gift. And there's also toys that we give out to uh, kids that need that in our neighborhood. To make all of that happen, we need your help. And so on your way in this morning, you got this little piece of paper that has two sides to it. Uh, the idea is that you're gonna tear it in half and take one home and put it on your fridge to remind you about this. The other half, you're gonna give back to us. Or at least you're gonna email us with the information that's on that. What I'm gonna ask you this morning is kind of walk through this little piece of paper so you know how you might be involved. So first of all, we need a lot of volunteers. In fact, during the week, we probably have more than 150 to maybe 200 volunteers that help us. We are so thankful that we have some partnering churches that take up a lot of that during the week, but we need you as well. We need people from James North to come and take part. You can help during the week, every day during that week, and you'll see the dates on this uh, piece of paper. It starts on Monday the 13th. We set up a toy shop, and then we have parents come and shop at the toy shop. That's Monday and Tuesday. On Wednesday, we start the process of putting all the groceries into the boxes. Wednesday and Thursday night. On Friday, we put that all into delivery routes. And then on Saturday, we deliver all of those boxes. Where we really need you guys is a few of you during the week, but especially on the Saturday morning to help us deliver. 
And so I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. So we need the volunteers. The other thing we need are donations. And there's kind of two sides to donations. The first is toys. We want to collect a whole lot of toys so that our toy shop gives great variety and selection to parents as they come in. Uh, where we always have trouble getting toys is for the 8 to 12 age bracket. So we're asking you to help us particularly with that. So if you would go and shop for a toy, we suggest about a $25 value, that you would go pick up a toy, bring it here to the church over the next few weeks so that we can then stock a wonderful toy shop on that day. Uh, if you also want to just contribute financially towards that, we accept that, of course, as well. This whole thing costs 25000 at least, uh, maybe even more, depends how many boxes we end up doing. And so you can help out that way. If uh, you're a student and you wonder how you're going to go out and afford to buy a toy, uh, Dwayne always suggests get your parents' credit card and then go shopping. I'm not sure how serious that is, but it's not a bad idea. Tell them what you're going to do and they might let you do that. But just go and particularly think about the 8 to 12 age category. Think about what you were doing when you were that age and what kind of toy you would enjoy. The second area of donations is that our church is responsible for gathering 300 cans of apple juice and 300 boxes of stuffing. And so over the next several weeks, we're asking you that as you go shopping, pick up a can or two of apple juice and bring that into the church. Do the same with the stuffing. And we'll put all of those things together. And so those are kind of the donation side of things. Where we need you even more, though, like donations and things like that are really helpful, but we need you to help us out to adopt some Christmas hamper families. On the little page, we say, make it personal. Our desire in doing this is, you know, in one sense, yes, we want to help people physically. We want to help people to have the best Christmas that they can, and we want kids to have toys and to make it a really joyous and celebrative season. But more, we want the opportunity to connect with people in the name of Jesus Christ, to connect with them and to be able to share the gospel. And every year we have opportunities with, out of the 300 families, that God raises up and chooses a few particular people that we are able to have deeper conversations with. And you as a church family are the vanguard of people that are going to make that happen. And what we'd like you to do is to adopt two or more families and say that they will be your prayer, prayer project. And on the sheet, we give you four uh, ways to connect. Uh, we ask you to pray for the families that we're going to give you. We try to give that to you a couple of weeks ahead of time. And then you begin to pray and ask for God to open doors and hearts that somehow during this Christmas season that the true meaning of the incarnation would become uh, real in people's hearts and lives. Then we're going to ask you to connect with those families. They have already called us. They already know that they're getting a hamper. But we ask you to give them a call and just say, hey, I'm going to be delivering your hamper on Saturday the 18th. Just want to make sure we've got the right information. If you're getting toys, do you remember when you're coming to the toy shop? And maybe you would even arrange that you would meet them at the toy shop that night and help them shop for things. See, this is how we're trying to make it personal, that they know that it's a face. This isn't just a handout, but that we're encouraging you to uh, connect with these people in some special ways through this season. And then on the 18th, we ask you to deliver those boxes that you've chosen. And finally, after Christmas, we always put it on an event. It's Christianity Explored. It's uh, an evening of dinner, and we explain the gospel and invite them to Bible study. We ask you to make that invitation for us after Christmas. So that's what it means to adopt Christmas hamper families. It means a little bit of time. It means some uh, involvement in your part. But it is a great opportunity for us to connect with these neighbors in our neighborhood in this special and unique way. So today what we're asking you to do is to take that form, tear it in half, put your name, give us your contact information, how many families in particular they're going to adopt, and then if you know when you're able to help out during the week, let us know that you're coming so we can make the preparations for that. We'd really love to get these back from you today, if possible, or in the next couple of weeks, or take it home with you, but email the office, and just email the information, all right? Just when you email, say, hey, I'll adopt a couple of, a couple of hamper families, and I will help out on uh, delivering on the Saturday. 
All right? So that's what we're asking you to do, how you respond, how you help us in making this hamper, in hamper ministry into ministry, not just kind of giving things out. Lots of groups in the city give food and toys at Christmas. But our heart is we want to connect with some people very specially during this season. So help us out. Fill that out. You can leave it at the welcome desk. You can give it in at the office or email us this week. All right? Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. Between our two services, we're averaging nearly 400 people now uh, on Sundays. And uh, so that means that collecting 300 cans of apple juice and 300 boxes of stuffing should be easy. Each of us go out and buy one. Now, some of you are going to go out and buy a case, and that's great. If we have extra, we'll put extra in. And then with toys, literally each of us going out. Now, I know there's, you know, 80 kids or so, but... But, you know, that's, that's 300 toys, $25 to $40, that each of us just go out and between zero-year-old and 12-year-old, uh, and some of you, you know, you weren't 12 that long ago, so you might remember what it's like to be 12, and you might be better at getting them a gift that's more appropriate than I would be, because I'm 50 now. Um, but together, we're able to do that. Together, we're able to provide. We don't just need to rely on all the people from the outside that are amazing, our donors and uh, people to help with that. And then the second thing that Paul said is, is ministry isn't just about stuff, it's about people. This is our opportunity to invest in the lives of people that are participating in our programs and ministries from across the city and introduce them to the Savior, Jesus Christ. We have the privilege of doing that, of sharing his love with them. And so, as Paul said, take that information, think about it and pray about it, but I strongly encourage you to give, Figure out what you can give and to participate. Hear this from Romans 1 as we turn our attention to the Lord in worship. The Word of God says this. Paul says, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to those who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God that brings salvation to anyone who believes, first for the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We gather this morning, O oh God, as your people. We are thankful for amazing opportunities we have, for the opportunity we have, God, to participate in a walk-a-thon so that we can see more funding come in as, God, you provided this amazing opportunity to have an interest-free mortgage by the end of this year. God, that's something only you could do. And so would you be with us as we think throughout what our participation in that would look like? God, we're also mindful of this season with Christmas hamper and Christmas dinner. May you provide up the volunteers needed to come alongside and serve at the Christmas dinner. May you provide the volunteers needed with the Christmas hampers. God, may each of us be burdened to think through, can we give up a meal uh, that we would go out and eat to buy some toys for kids, some stuffing, some some apple juice? Can we donate to Stanford? Can we be invested in a couple of families' lives, calling them, talking to them, inviting out to be a part of what we're doing here, and God, sharing with them as you open the doors who Jesus is. So God, we ask that you would open up doors as we prayerfully discern who we may invite into this. And then we're thankful for the gospel, supremely thankful for the gospel. You, Lord Jesus, chose to come and give your life up for us so that we could be saved, so that you could take anyone from darkness to light, so that you could take anyone from despair to hope, so that you could bring anyone into the realm of your kingdom. We're so thankful that you have chosen and you delight in saving. And now, as we turn our attention to you, the living God of this universe who loves to save, cause us to worship you in spirit and truth. We ask this in the powerful, resurrected name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. with us. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. 
Jesus, the only one that could ever sing. 
God, that you are great and that your love for us is immense. We thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. And we thank you that we cry out you are great because of your salvation in our lives. As we continue to worship you, we ask your blessing on us in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to ask Derek and Fiona, uh, and if you want your kids to come up with me. We have the privilege of the church of having staff and having multiple staff, and over the years, we've had the privilege of having some of us here for quite some time, and so uh, Paul and Diana Havercroft are, I believe, just probably starting their 15th year, Marcia and Eleni are in their 14th year, Jenna would be then kind of in her 15th year, um, and so that's very unusual for a church, just so you know, that staff and support staff stay at a church this long, Diana Crosby in her ninth year, that is just an incredibly unusual thing. And Derek and Fiona uh, have just celebrated being here with us five years. And so we're so excited. There we are. There you guys are. My daughter had some amazing pictures of you in your youth yeah. that she wanted to desperately put up here. 
and show what you guys look like. But it is such a joy and a delight to serve with you guys. Um, Fiona, we have just always appreciated your heart. You bring such an amazing balance to Derek, and I mean that in a great way. Um, but you have such a passion for people. You have a passion for the Lord. Um, you love just getting in and, and walking alongside of people. Um, as a family, Amy and I have just so appreciated you um, and your heart. And Derek, we have loved you here, um, both as in who you are as a person uh, and as our youth pastor. You have such a passion for youth. And, and, um, and one of the things when we were looking for someone that was really important to us was someone who can teach the word, who can handle the word well. And we're so thankful for the way you handle the word. I mean, every time you preach, I mean, we haven't heard this morning yet, but up until now, no up until now, no pressure. Every time you've preached, I've been like, wow, God speaks through you. I'll let you know after today what I think. Um, but we're so thankful for the gifts that God have give, has given you. We're so thankful for the ways that God is, uses you. And God uses you in the lives of our youth. God uses you in the lives of our parents. God uses you in the lives of the people in our community. And you have such a passion both for those that don't know the Lord to come to faith in the Lord and those that know the Lord to grow in their faith and knowledge of the Lord. So for five years of serving with us, we want to just say thank you today. And uh, as a gift of appreciation, we have uh, two leaf tickets for you and Fiona. And so we're going to send you guys to a leaf game. And if you want, um, wait, is someone else asking to go with you? No, I said sorry. Sorry. Um, and if you want, after the service at the welcome desk, this card will be there. And uh, Diana Crosby made it. It's awesome. It's Derek. You're, I thought you might be playing hockey, but you're actually a fan. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so you're welcome to sign the card after the service to thank Derek and Fiona for their service here. And this is the better part. Now, you don't have to take them up on the offer. You can use family. But uh, Uncle Phil and Aunt Jenna have offered to babysit that night. And uh, is Phil, oh, Phil's gone. He was here a minute ago. I was going to say, does Phil even know that that's been offered? Um, but Phil and Jenna have offered to do that. So let me pray for you guys. And then after that, I'm going to dismiss our kids. God, we are so thankful for your goodness to us and grace in our lives. We thank you for Derek and Fiona and the ways that you've used them to impact our church community, specifically our youth. God, we ask your blessing upon them and their family, on their children, God, on Aubrey, on Avi, on Sully. We thank you for them. May you guide them as parents as they raise uh, as they raise their kids. We thank you for family that's with them today, God. We're so thankful for the way that you use um, their family in their life. And so we ask your blessing on their whole family and extended family. And uh, God, as you use Derek and Fiona here, may you bless them. Specifically, Derek, as you use him in the lives of our youth, God, in a, in a day when they are, they are bombarded with so much, whether it's social media, school, peer, uh, around the philosophy and ideology of the, wor of the world, God, as you use Derek in their lives, may he uphold your word, may your salvation be one that just powerfully works among our youth in a way, God, that we see numbers of them repent of sin and trust in you as Savior, falling in love with you. So may you empower him, may you strengthen him, may you guide him, may you walk with him. We're so thankful for uh, Derek and the way that you use him here. And so we ask your blessing on him and on him and Fiona and their kids, asking this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. God bless you guys and thank you. And uh, at this time... We'll dismiss the kids, and so as we continue to worship our God in song, I will indicate to each section of the room, starting over here, uh, that the kids can go out, and Diana Crosby, Mrs. Crosby's at the door, and you can head out with her. Inspiration, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. 
is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What I could fathom, such boundless grace. The God of angels stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior. I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain, there's salvation. You guys can. <laughs> oh.
There we go. Uh, <laughs> good, technology, we're good. I'm going to assume that God heard that prayer, so we'll just continue going on. And we'll be in Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 22, as we get started today. Um, and also, just thank you very much for those kind words and things, but what an awful thing to do to somebody before they have to preach. Um, so <laughs> let's try to compose ourselves, and we'll move along here. Belief is a, is a funny thing, isn't it? I mean, in my years of working in youth ministry, one of the questions I get asked the most is, why do you believe in the gospel? Why do you believe that what the Bible says is true? Why would you build your life on something that you can't prove? And it's interesting because the word belief gets used in a lot of ways in our culture, right? I believe that one day I will see the Leafs win the Stanley Cup. I believe it. <laughs> I believe that the best food is crab legs. I believe, I actually had a conversation with this with my neighbor, I believe, and he agreed with me, that Kermit the Frog is one of the greatest philosophers of his generation, which maybe just made some of you tune me out for the rest of today, but we'll see what we can do. But when it comes to God and our relationship with him, belief needs to be something more than a hunch, more than a feeling, more than a preference. Belief is something different altogether when it comes to something as serious as what the Bible says. In fact, George MacDonald, one of C.S. Lewis's favorite authors, wrote these words, a man's real belief is that which he lives by. What a man believes is the thing he does, not the thing he thinks. In fact, there's a story that reminds me of this, where you get to see it lived out in real life. At the turn of the third century, North Africa, there was a woman named Perpetua. She was 22 years old, recently married, and recently had a baby. She had become a Christian and was going to baptism classes to prepare for her baptism when she and the rest of her class were arrested because the Roman emperor at the time was trying to squash Christianity and Northern Africa was actually a hotspot for Christian growth. And these people who were arrested were given a chance, deny your faith in Jesus Christ or be thrown into the arena with the gladiators and the wild animals. And Perpetua, before her, before her trial, was in prison where she was met by her father who pled with her, just deny being a Christian. Do it for me, do it for your husband, do it for your child. And Perpetua pointed out a vase in the room and said to her father, do you see this vase here? Could it be called by any other name than what it is? And her father answered, no. So she said, well, neither can I be called anything other than what I am, a Christian. That is what belief looks like. It's not a hunch. It's not a gut feeling. It's something that is who you are and what you do. And the question for us today should be, well, how do we believe like that? What does that belief actually look like? How is that realistic for any of us in this room? And as we look today at Acts chapter 4, what we see is the first time that the early church leaders were thrown in jail, the first time that they faced real persecution, and through their belief, through their answers that they give, we can see what belief looks like and how we can hold on to that same belief that they had. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through the, the passage together, and then I just have three points, three things I want you to remember as we go through this today. So we'll start in verse 1 here. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. So right away we know we need a little bit of context here. We're, we're jumping into the middle of a story in chapter 4. You see, in chapter 3, which we went over a couple weeks ago, there was a great healing. A man who was never able to walk was healed by the apostles. He was sitting outside the beautiful gate, begging, and instead, he was healed. 
and people are starting to notice that the apostles are going around bringing healing. They're starting to do incredible things. And as they are bringing these miracles forward in the name of Christ, they are starting to preach the gospel, continuing, sorry, to preach the gospel. And the church is growing. The message is spreading. God is building his kingdom. And the priests, the Sadducees, the captain of the temple guard, they're noticing And so they come up to Peter and John while they're speaking to the people. And this is what it says. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. They couldn't have a trial that night. They couldn't pull together all of the, the priests, all of the judges in the Sanhedrin. So Peter and John have to stay in jail overnight. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Now, a couple things here before we move on from this section. The religious leaders of the time in, in, in Israel are starting to become annoyed at the ongoing message of Christ. And they're starting to take action. They're starting to squash it. They're going to do whatever they can to make sure that the message doesn't continue. And they're disturbed because this message that has been given to the apostles from Christ is ruining everything that these Sadducees, these priests want. You see, it says here that part of this group is the captain of the temple guard, and that's actually the second highest position in Judaism at the time. This person, the, the captain, was responsible for keeping the peace. They were responsible for making sure the Romans don't get upset. And they did this by making sure that any messianic talk, any ideas of the Messiah, don't spread among the Jewish people. That the Romans don't start to think that there's an uprising about to happen. The Sadducees are a group of religious leaders who got their power because they were willing to work with Rome. Message after now. I, you can't. You, I, I get you, get, you gotta take that other one off. Are you sure? Well, I, I don't think it'll work well. Hold on. <laughs> I don't have your voice, though. If this doesn't work, we're done. <laughs> Kevin, you can come back up. Um, okay. <laughs> and why were they so upset? Because Peter and John are preaching that Jesus isn't dead, he's alive. That despite the efforts of the religious leaders of the time to silence the movement by executing Jesus, he rose from the dead. The Sadducees didn't believe in personal resurrection to begin with. They believed maybe one day God would restore all of Israel to its heights, to its glory. But they didn't believe every person who died would be risen back to life again. And so as the apostles are preaching that Jesus has risen from the dead, that there's actual evidence for what they believe, that the Messiah is not dead but he's alive, the religious leaders take notice and they take action. And in the midst of all of this, we get this comment in verse 4 that says the church grew to about 5,000. And this is incredible. We often kind of just skip over this. But the last time we got an account of how large the church was, it was about 3,000 people. And in the matter of just weeks, it has exploded from 3,000 to 5,000. It's grown at 60% in just a number of weeks. And so the Sadducees, the religious leaders, are right to be afraid of what is going on because the message of God is spreading. People are accepting it. People are understanding the truth. God is at work 
and the Sadducees don't know what to do about it. And so they throw John and Peter into jail. Verse 5. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. So now they're going to have their trial. Everyone's coming together. Peter and John are going to face the judges. And here we see this. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas. John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests, and one of the former high priests. And in Israel... It's kind of like America. Once you're the president, you're always the president. And once you're the high priest, you're always the high priest. And so we have two high priests here. We have their family. We have all the Sadducees. But this is significant because Annas and Caiaphas were instrumental in the, uh, in the execution of Jesus. They were there orchestrating everything that was happening. They were the ones who were there uh, making sure that Jesus went to the cross. And here they are again now dealing with his apostles. Could you imagine the frustration that they have as they thought they had dealt with the problem, yet it keeps going? They cut off the head, and then two more come up. No matter what they do, no matter what they try, the word of God will not stop. And so they ask these guys, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed." It says Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, which is actually different than being full of the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is actually this moment of God empowering Peter in this moment of need, empowering Peter as he faces a trial, empowering Peter as he faces these questions. You see, Peter was saved. He already had the Holy Spirit in him. This is a way of Luke, as he writes the history of the church, to say, in this moment of need, God gave Peter the strength, the wisdom, to respond to the situation that he was in. Often, as Christians, we tend to think ahead and we ask the question, when I face my trials, will I have the strength to honor God and be faithful to him? But what we see here as we look at what God does for Peter is we're asking the wrong question. The question isn't, I hope my faith is secure enough that I will keep going, that that I will have the strength to face my trials. What we see here is we can trust that God will give us the strength we need to face the trial that we are in. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is a significant phrase here in this chapter. And we can trust that just like God equips Peter, just like God gives Peter the wisdom that he needs in this moment, just like God gives Peter that sense of security in Christ in this moment, we can trust that God will do the same for us. We don't have to worry how we will respond. We need to trust that God will fill us with the Spirit as we need it. And then Peter takes this opportunity, this this trial where all of the religious leaders, all of the bigwigs in Israel are there in front of him trying to silence him. And he takes this opportunity to preach the gospel to them. He makes it known that although they had sentenced Jesus to death, God has raised him back to life. Although they consider Jesus guilty... Jesus fulfilled the law. The law had no hold on him. And so as God looked at him, he raised him back to life. And in so doing, Jesus defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated the enemy. He let them know that the reason this man is healed, this man who couldn't walk before, is because Jesus is alive and at work. And then he quotes a passage to them, but he does something really significant here. He quotes Psalm uh, 118, 
And he says this, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And he does something significant here. See, when we do youth ministry downstairs and, and we do our studies and we split up into small groups, what we decided to do was to create questions that would help students learn to read the Bible on their own. Every week, no matter the passage, the questions we ask right now are, what do you learn about people in the passage? What do you learn about God in the passage? And then, why does this passage matter to you? And the reason we do that is to ingrain those questions in the kids' heads as they read scripture so that they would be able to learn on their own, so that they would find fulfillment in reading their, their Bibles because they're not just reading them because they have to, they're not just reading them because it's entertaining, because if you're trying to be entertained, pick up Harry Potter. You read the Bible so that you can learn from it, so that God would speak to you. And that question, that last question, why does this passage mean anything to you is the most significant. How does what I'm reading here affect my life? But you see, what Peter does here is he takes a passage and he applies it to the Sadducees for them. You see, the passage actually reads, the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And he changes it to, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. You see, he's telling them that they are rejecting God's redemption plan. They are rejecting the power of God. God has, has, has brought redemption to his people through Christ. Christ is the cornerstone that holds all of God's work together. He is the cornerstone of the kingdom of God. He went to the cross to pay for the penalty of sin for his people so that people may be brought back to God. He is what holds it all together, and they have rejected the cornerstone. He makes it personal to them. And then he says this, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Why is Jesus the cornerstone of God's kingdom? Because it's through him that people are saved. It's through him that our sins are forgiven. It's through him that we move from death to life. And in all of this frustration Peter and John must feel in being falsely imprisoned and put on trial, Peter still preaches the gospel to the people who are persecuting him. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. We must be saved. Him, John, and them. He wants them to know that they can still be saved. They don't have to continue to reject the cornerstone. They can embrace Christ. They can claim him as Messiah. They can understand and acknowledge who he is and bow under his grace and mercy. See, this, this section here, starting in verse 8, started with Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you want to know when you're sharing the gospel or when you're in a, a contentious conversation, if you're filled with the Spirit, what we see is, if you're filled with the Spirit, you will be talking about the gospel. You will be talking about Christ. You will be pointing to him. In fact, if you go to Galatians chapter 5, you get the fruit of the Spirit passage. Starting in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have been crucified, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Don't you see that as, as Peter is talking that kindness, that gentleness, that patience that he has where he's willing to share the gospel with the people who are persecuting him. He doesn't attack them. He doesn't get angry at them. He clearly points out their need of the scripture and then shows them how, or their need of the gospel and shows them how Jesus fulfilled it. That's the Holy Spirit there. We'll continue on in the text. 
verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could not see the man, uh, since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. They recognize that there's nothing they can do here to Peter and John. The, the man who they healed is literally standing, and I think Luke uses that word on purpose, standing there with Peter and John. Couldn't stand before, but he's standing there with them now. He has been healed. This took place. It happened. They can't deny it. People have seen him. And so they're just going to threaten them and let them go. But it's interesting to see what they think about Peter and John. These men had no official training, yet they spent years with Jesus, learning the word, steeping in scripture, spending time with the Messiah. And they could see that these men had been with Jesus. Why? Because every time the Sadducees tried to trap Jesus, every time they tried to trick him with their questions, every time they tried to set up a situation where they would be proven right, Jesus always came out on top. And here again, Peter, following in the steps of his rabbi, shows them wisdom that they could not possibly understand. And so they have to let them go. Verse 18. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. They threaten them. They tell them to stop, and Peter and John say, As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They say, we aren't going to lie. We're not going to pretend that this didn't happen. Jesus died and rose again. He is the Messiah. He has conquered sin. He has conquered death, and everyone has a right to know it. God has created people to worship him and this is how God is enabling people to do it. We cannot stop praising. We cannot stop talking about the greatness of our God, the greatness of our Messiah. Whatever you do to us, you can do, but we will not be silent. And in a case where the religious leaders ask, tell the apostles, to stop preaching the, the gospel, the apostles say, it's not an option. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you do. We will not stop sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. When it comes to sharing the gospel or facing the persecution around them, the consequences around them, they say it's not a choice at all. We will just keep doing what we've been doing. This is too serious. This is too real. This is too important to let anything that could happen to us get in the way. And then our passage today ends with, the people were praising God for what had happened. This isn't about the trial and them being like, oh, this is about the man who has been healed. The people have seen the man being healed. They've heard the message of God and they have responded and people are praising. And this is a great reminder that whatever we do, as a church, whatever we do as Christians who are following Christ, it must point to the glory of God. It must point to the fact that people have been saved, that people 
can turn to Jesus and follow him as Messiah. As we set up, uh, forward and start our Christmas hampers, we aren't just providing hampers for people, we're pointing to the gospel. As we have conversations with our friends and families and, and coworkers, as we, we care for needs of the people around us, it's all done so that God might be praised. It's all done to show the glory of what Christ has done on the cross as he has taken on the curse of sin and is reversing it. As we seek to help people understand God, as we seek to restore people, we need to do it in a way that brings glory to him, in a way where people see why we're doing what we're doing, and it's because of Christ. And so there's three things that I want to close with today. When it comes to understanding what belief looks like, how do we live the way that these apostles lived, there are three things that we need to see in this passage. The first is this. The resurrection is the foundation of their belief. I don't know if you caught this, but, but in our passage, when it talks about why the, the religious leaders are upset, it says in verse 2, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead. When the apostles were going around sharing the gospel, the focus that they had was on the resurrection. And this is interesting because I feel like in our day, we often focus on the crucifixion. Jesus died for your sins so that you could be forgiven. But here, the apostles point to the resurrection. Why? Why the resurrection? Why is that the foundation? Why is that what they hold on to as they face these trials? Why is that the grounding of their belief? Because it happened. Trip Lee, who was a pastor in the States and a, a hip-hop artist, he, he wrote these words. This is actually a tweet that he had, but it still counts. Uh, the resurrection doesn't just give us hope because it's a nice story. It gives us life because it really happened. They can't deny the gospel no matter what the religious leaders do to them because they've met the risen Christ. The resurrection proves that Jesus is who he said he was, that Jesus died for our sins and is still alive. In fact, C.S. Lewis writes this in his book, Miracles, talking about uh, the preaching that the apostles do in the book of Acts. This is what he writes. The resurrection is the central theme in every Christian sermon reported in the Acts. The resurrection and its consequences were the gospel, or the good news which the Christians brought. It's the resurrection that shows us the power of Christ. It's the resurrection that shows us every claim Jesus made is true. It's the resurrection that shows us that our sin has been forgiven because Christ has dealt with it and come back to life. It's the resurrection that shows the people that the way life is right now isn't the way life is going to be. Death isn't the final word. Persecution is not the final word. Sickness is not the final word. Separation from God is not the final word. Our sin is not the final word. Life is the final word because of the resurrection. Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sins, and God raised him back to life. And that is a historical fact that we can count on. That is proof that God is real, that Jesus is alive, and our sins have been accounted for, and we can trust in that. But the second thing we need to see here is that the resurrection doesn't guarantee belief. We have two people that were directly involved in the crucifixion story, Caiaphas and Annas, who see evidence of the risen Christ. The one that they put to death is alive. This man has been healed in Jesus' name, and he's standing before them. The church is growing because the kingdom of God is moving. The apostles are preaching the same way Jesus did. The tomb is empty, and yet they don't believe. Daryl L. Bach, in his commentary on this section, writes this, The fact that the miracle is not responded to in a proper way, given its role as a sign, portrays the leaders as hard-hearted, 
No evidence will count for them or cause them to change their negative response towards those associated with Jesus. It doesn't matter what these people see. They've decided that they aren't going to believe in Christ. And there are all kinds of reasons people don't believe. For some, the story is just too hard to believe. For others, they see the terrible way that some Christians have lived and the persecution that the church has done, and they associate that with the whole movement. This idea of trying to squash what Christianity is all about didn't end in the book of Acts. It continued. There's lots of people who have tried to come against Christianity. One of the most famous ones is a guy named Voltaire, who was a French philosopher during the Enlightenment. And he said that a hundred years after his death, the only use that anybody would have for a Bible is that it would be a nice antique. He believed that there would be no real Christians a hundred years after he died. He died in the 1700s. And you know what happened? This is almost kind of cruel. Uh, the Geneva Bible Society ended up owning his house, and they used his house as a storeroom for all the Bibles that they were handing out to believers. And then they used his printing press, which he used to write things against Christianity, to print the Bibles that they needed as the church kept growing. It doesn't matter what you try to do to come against the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter who you are. You can't stop what God is doing. Yet these people just refuse to believe. Timothy Keller writes, Belief or non-belief in the resurrection is never merely an intellectual process. We are not computers. We are flesh and, flesh and blood human beings. And when we confront the claim of the resurrection, we address it not only with logic, but with a lifetime of hopes and fears and pre-existing faith commitments. And we will never be able to accept it until we see our need for God's grace. See, the biggest issue for the Sadducees here was they didn't want to admit that they needed God's grace. They liked their life the way it was. And to accept the resurrection would to be to accept that they were flawed, that they were sinful, and they needed God. The only thing that's going to make people believe is for them to understand that they need the gospel in their lives. And so we should be praying for the hearts of people praying that God would break, for, break through their hard-heartedness, that he would make them aware of their need of salvation, that he would make them aware of the truth of the resurrection and how that changes everything for them. And the last thing we see here is that the resurrection empowers belief. This belief that Peter and John have is not just an intellectual belief that they rest assured in. They take their belief out. They are arrested for preaching the gospel. They are put in trial, and they continue to preach the gospel. They are threatened, and they continue to preach the gospel. Everything they do, everything they say is about pointing to Jesus, letting people know that they can have a relationship with God, that their sin doesn't need to hold them back anymore, that through the cross and the resurrection, they can be forgiven, they can come to God. Their belief changes how they live. It's not something they think, it's who they are and what they do. This resurrection, this hope that they have in the life of Christ empowers them to be bold and share the gospel with everyone that they meet. And so if we want to believe the way these men do, then we need to know that our belief is grounded in the resurrection, that Jesus is alive, and that we need to live out our belief and let everybody else know as well. I'm going to invite the band to come back up and we're going to close. I want to give you one more Timothy Keller quote. This is one of my favorite quotes, and I share this with students a lot. But when it comes to why do we believe, how do we believe, Timothy Keller writes this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? 
The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teachings, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Why do you believe what you believe? How do you build your life on the gospel? How do you have the courage to accept what's said in scripture? Because Jesus is not dead, he's alive. Your sins have been accounted for. Turn to him and repent and believe and follow him because the resurrection happened. We can believe. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that despite all the challenges today, we were able to get through this, God, and we pray that you would take these words that you've given us today and and just pray plant them in our hearts, encourage us, equip us to follow you, to believe, and to be empowered to share that belief with those around us. We thank you for the cross. We thank you that you rose your son from the dead. We thank you that you have done it, and it is accomplished. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand with us. to your name, O ancient of days, your holy. We tremble before your throne. My hearts prepare your room. We come and adore you in before your glory. Great is the Lord. I will sing, I will shout. 
my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested in my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given. chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom me Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. Amen. Uh, just a couple of things as we go. If you have children downstairs, we encourage you to go down this far stairwell over here or the far stairwell um, in the offices to head downstairs to get your children. Uh, there's a card out in the foyer on the welcome desk to sign for Derek and Fiona. Uh, if you've been impacted by their ministry or your children have, I'd encourage you to sign that card uh, and just to say thanks. You write a couple of words or just put your signature on it, whatever you'd like to do there. And uh, if you're interested in knowing more about the Walkathon um, in a week and a half, you can talk to Miriam, but please sign up uh, in the next couple of days so that we know that you are wanting to come. Hear this from 1 Corinthians 15. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. 
For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the fir first fruits, then when he come, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet, the last enemy to destroy his death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when he says everything has been put under him, it is clear that doesn't include the Father, who has put everything under Christ. And when this is done, the Son himself will be made subject to him, who has put everything under him, that God may be all in all. And God's people said, amen. Have a great day in the Lord.